Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club's seventh annual Freedom of the Press Awards luncheon. My name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the National Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, first, uh, a reminder of coming luncheons. Excuse me. On Friday, March 17th, John Bruton, the Prime Minister of Ireland, will talk about the first peaceful St. Patrick's Day and the future of Northern Ireland. On Tuesday, March 21st, Senator Phil Graham, Republican of Texas and a presidential hopeful, will address the club. And on Thursday, March 23rd, U.S. Trade Representative Mickey Cantor will discuss U.S. trade after China. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of Press Club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our featured speaker today, please write them on the cards at your table, pass them up, and I will ask as many as time permits. Today we are commemorating Freedom of Information Day which, as it happens, is the birthday of James Madison, author of the First Amendment. We're here not only to honor those who have made important contributions to freedom of the press around the world, but also to remind us of why press freedom is so important. The Committee to Protect Journalists today released its annual report, Attacks on the Press in 1994, which documents a record number of reporters who were beaten, imprisoned, and killed last year. Before getting into today's program, I'd like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Lucy Dalglish, Freedom of Information Chairperson, for the Society of Professional Journalists. Jane Kirtley, Executive Director, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Gil Klein, Media General News Service and immediate past president of the National Press Club. John Walcott, an editor at US News and World Report, a former colleague of mine. Sonia Hilgren, Farm Journal and Vice President of the National Press Club. Dr. Abdul Abdulaziz, Al Sakaf, Al Sakaf, excuse me, publisher and editor in chief of the Yemen Times. Skipping over our speaker, Pam Constable of the Washington Post and chair of the National Press Club Freedom of the Press Committee. David D. Cook, uh, another one of our winners here from the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania Patriot News. Lee Feldman, National Planning. Uh, Capital Planning Commission and Chair of the Freedom of the uh, Press Awards Judging Panel. Brian Duffy, another colleague, former colleague, uh, uh, editor at uh, U.S. News and World Report magazine. Kati Martin, Chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Kalela Kalau, winner of the 1993 International Freedom of the Press Award, who came to us from Zaire uh, over a year ago. He has spent the entire year uh, in the United States learning a new talent. He would like to come up and demonstrate it to you. <laughs> Speak English. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, today I must thank the National Press Club for all the help you have given me. 
Thanks. <coughs> Good. Thank you. A year ago, Mr. Kalau could not speak a word of English. I'd also like to recognize four of the judges of the Freedom of the Press Awards, Andy Mosier of the Washington Post, Pierre Lesourd of Agency France Press, Robert Doherty of Reuters, and Daniel Franklin of The Economist. They're all sitting at the table back there. Please stand, please. <laughs> and finally, I would like to recognize the ambassador from Yemen, his Excellency Moshin Al Ani. <laughs> Today we are honoring four journalists for their outstanding contributions to press freedom. The first place winners in the domestic category are David D. Cook of the Patriot News of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and jointly John Walcott and Brian Duffy of U.S. News and World Report. In the international category, <coughs> excuse me, the winner is Ab Abdu Abdu I have trouble with this, I'm sorry. Abdualziz Asaka, all right? Editor and publisher of the Yemen Times. David de Cook, as a reporter for the Patriot News, documented the collapse of the corporate life insurance company, the largest insurance company failure in the history of Pennsylvania. And he did it despite a gag order by a local judge. Because of this order, insurance agents selling the policies to customers who called to check on corporate life's condition were told by the state insurance department that all was well with the company. In fact, it was not. After the Patriot News went to court, the cook was allowed access to the sealed documents for one day and one day only. What emerged from his investigation were the records uh, and numerous interviews was a complex story of bad business, alleged fraud, and feeble regulation. State lawmakers are considering public hearings to look into the situation. Uh, David, would you come forward, please? Congratulations. My congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you have your turn. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this caps one of the more fascinating stories I ever worked on, and it uh, goes to show that when the uh, sports editor of your newspaper gives you a tip that doesn't involve horse racing, listen carefully. <laughs> That's what got me on the corporate life story. Boiled down to its essence, this was a story about the importance of a free flow of facts. A 21-month gag order by Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court prevented the state insurance department from telling anyone what a bad company corporate life was. At the same time, it allowed the insurance department to conceal its own incompetent handling of the corporate life affair, and it allowed corporate life to continue to sell millions of dollars worth of annuities to thousands of unknowing victims while this fiasco was in progress, all the while telling the court it was the victim of a state vendetta. Facts have a history of being inconvenient, and I think one of the greatest services we do as journalists is to challenge conventional wisdom with facts, being it, be it the truth about, say, the McDonald's coffee lady incident, or in our case, what lay behind the $250 million collapse of a small life insurance company. We risk too much if we allow myths and lies to masquerade as the truth. I'm continually surprised and touched at how grateful members of the public can be when you make an effort to tell the truth about something they really care about. Sometimes we don't realize what a negative opinion of the press that some people have. I was talking the other day to the chief clerk of Commonwealth Court, and he knew a lot about the corporate life case. He had heard about my award, and he told me how much he liked my stories. You know, he said, you could have taken a populist approach. You could have written it to make Commonwealth Court look bad. You could have made the insurance department look bad. And you could have made corporate life look bad. And at this point, I'm thinking, did I wimp out or what? But he continued, no, you stuck to the facts. And it dawned on me that he thought most of us would do otherwise, that we would distort the truth or publish rumor and speculation to make a better story. In truth, my series made them all look bad, but the facts wouldn't have it any other way. 
I want to thank the National Press Club for this distinguished award, the Patriot News of Harrisburg for the considerable amount of time and resources that made this story possible, and my wife Lisa for her personal support. Thank you all. U.S. News and World Report editors John Walcott and Brian Duffy began an investigation of the CIA following the arrest, the much publicized arrest, of Aldrich Ames. The U.S. News account focused on the CIA's operations directorate, the agency's elite clandestine service. What they found were fraudulent reports of agent recruitment, million dollar payments to double agent, and the mishandling of defectors. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence voted to withhold funding of a portion of the CIA budget until better management and accountability procedures were put in place, all as a result of the U.S. News and World Report story. John and Brian, congratulations. Thank you to the judges and all of you for coming here. I, I have to admit that I, I feel a little embarrassed sharing a podium with Dr. Al Sakaf and with our other colleagues who, who have to practice our craft under much more difficult circumstances than any of us in the United States will ever experience. Uh, the job of trying to, to bring to countries that have no tradition of freedom of the press a free press is far more difficult than reporting on the clandestine service in the CIA. Secondly, uh, I think in awards of this type, the, the credit is often misplaced. And I think in this case, a lot of the credit goes to the people who spoke to us, to the officers of the, uh, the clandestine service, especially those who were still serving under, undercover, who had the courage to speak out about what they saw as the wrongdoing in their own institution. That, that takes far more courage than, than either Brian or I ever exhibited in the reporting of this story. And uh, I'd like to thank all of them by name, but I think I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, again, I'll just thank you all very much. And finally, Dr. Al Sakaf, publisher and editor-in-chief of Yemen's most independent newspaper, the Yemen Times. He has courageously reported on government corruption, mismanagement, and human rights abuses, despite enduring abuses of his own. During the civil war between North and South Yemen, the paper's account of the battle that started the war contradicted the official government line by t maintaining that it was the northern troops, not the southern, that opened fire first. He also published casualty figures time and again that were higher than official government estimates. He and six other journalists were arrested and beaten. He has survived. It took him three days, but he's here with us today, Dr. Kassaf. Thank you. I'd like to tell you that I come from a very small village from Yemen. I was the firstborn son in my father's family, and I was destined to be a bricklayer like my father. In our tradition, the firstborn son has to follow in the father's profession. As I grew up, something beautiful happened to me. The American government gave me a Fulbright scholarship. It broke that cycle, and I was finally a graduate from Harvard University. <coughs> it is a big change in my life. Today, this recognition will add another twist, positive twist, another change to my life, and I hope to the life of all my colleagues in my country as well as the region. 
I am extremely grateful. I believe that my country will prosper only if, if it becomes a good world citizen. And that's what I try to do in as little as I can. And I'm happy to note that my country is moving along this direction. For the last four years, we have been doing a lot to democratize the country, to move towards pluralism, liberal politics, and market economics. We have our ups and downs. I have myself suffered from the downs. But I'd like also to use this moment to give credit to my own country for the many ups in our recent history. Thank you all for everything. Our guest speaker today follows two simple rules. Write only what you see and never do anything dangerous just for fun. <laughs> These guidelines have given him a margin of credibility and safety on some of the bloodiest battlefields of the last three decades. Born in New England, <laughs> born in New Zealand, <laughs> Arnett moved from small newspapers to the Associated Press. In 1966, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the war in Vietnam, where he stayed until the fall of Saigon. As we all know, truth is frequently a casualty of war. From Vietnam to Grenada, from Panama to the Persian Gulf, Every effort was made to keep the American press away from the battlefield and from the sources of information. Arnett's probing coverage got him into trouble with American generals in Vietnam, KGB strongmen in Moscow, and presidents and presidential spokesmen in Washington. Most of us know Peter from his reporting from Baghdad on the Persian Gulf War for CNN. His was the last interview of Iraqi President Saddam Hussein with a Western reporter. He's no stranger to the Press Club, which honored him with its fourth estate award in 1991. After 35 years of reporting and 17 wars, I can think of no one more qualified to talk about freedom of the press than our guest speaker. We are privileged to have with us today Peter Arnett. Thanks. Thank you, Bud. And uh, my congratulations to all of you prize winners, all clearly richly deserved. I had the privilege of addressing uh, you folks for the first time <clears throat> four years ago, almost to this date. It was March 16, 1991, the day I returned from the Gulf War. Uh, I had bodyguards at that gathering. There were threatening phone calls. Conservative pickets were outside the press building protesting with their signs, Baghdad Pete. And uh, CNN was getting mail such as uh, this little letter, and it says, to Arnett, Holloman, and Shaw, the Three Stooges of Iraq. Or this one to me in the form of a verse which I dug out of my files the other day. It reads, <clears throat> there's a wonderful name, just give it a try. It sure sounds terrific when telling a lie. Benedict Arnett is simple and sweet. It fits most reporters, but you have got them beat. It is not signed Newt Gingrich. <laughs> I can't decipher the signature, but it's not Newt. So they were controversial days. Uh, those Gulf War days, there's been a lot of con controversy swirling around me, other reporters here in Washington and in battlefields since the Vietnam War basically opened up reporting when reporters began questioning American policy internationally. 
but I wish that the world's media in their own crises could face no more harmful threats than those angry pickets outside the press club four years ago that greeted me, or a few phone calls, or that doggerel voice that my Baghdad coverage inspired. In fact, as Bill Orm, executive director of the admirable Committee to Protect Journalists, <coughs> detailed so graphically this morning in his organization's annual report, our colleagues in at least 23 countries are more likely to be thrown in jail for journalistically challenging their governments. In fact, more reporters are in jail than ever before, he reported, or they could be killed. The committee mentions the cases of 58 journalists murdered for their reporting in 1994, the largest number since the organization began keeping statistics a decade ago. So I ask you today, are we doing enough to assist our colleagues abroad? Awards are wonderful. Support such as today's gathering, it's wonderful. Are we doing enough by assisting them? Are we advancing really the cause of free press and therefore democracy in this post-Cold uh, post War world? We have a notable record of defending abuse and defamation against journalists here at home. In a real sense, I believe we also have a responsibility for the fate of our embattled colleagues abroad. One of the reasons is that we are the role model for many of these threatened journalists. <clears throat> our prize winner from Yemen, a Fulbright scholar, graduated from Harvard, surely imbued in Harvard, uh, Harvard with the American uh, ideals of democracy, of press freedom. Many reporters that I meet abroad say they've been inspired by the American media and its traditions. The, Ameri the media is claimed to be the linchpin of our democracy. Ask Russian camera crews who covered the Chechen war in December and January, why did they cover that war so valiantly? And they'll cite the example of CNN's coverage of the attempted Moscow coup against Boris Yeltsin in 93 is the example they want to follow. I met so many young reporters from Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and Africa uh, wanting my advice on becoming a war correspondent because they watch what CNN does. And how many young guys want to be Larry King and interview celebrities and have their own celebrity shows in Africa and Europe and elsewhere? And of course, America's major newspapers for those who have access to them, to them for reporters, broadcasters, and others who visit the United States, their examples that um, newly emerging democracies, publishers would desire to emulate. So our system is the role model for a developing world of newspapers, magazines, and broadcasters. It's an embattled world, but it's also a fascinating one, and I know it's an inspiring one for all of us who believe that free press and free thought are integral to free people. I've been calling around uh, some of the uh, executives, officials, colleagues who are more active in the pursuit of basic freedoms, who are interested in, uh, in what's going on in the world, who are reporting to us about what's going on. And from then I've learned that it's not all bad news. Uh, one of the reasons that there is more repression against the media today is that there is more media to repress. Not so long ago in many of these now violent environments, there was uh, no free press whatsoever. So uh, we are involved, I've learned, probably to a greater degree than you realize in really aiding and helping our international colleagues to establish themselves. So let me quickly run through at this point sort of what's happening out there and what we're uh, doing about it. <coughs> we have the Committee to Protect Journalists, which reported this morning. We know what they're doing, their activities, monitoring international events, bringing in students, officials, others, putting out pamphlets to our own correspondents who go to cover wars, how to conduct themselves, helping our people along with uh, journalists in the countries they're, they're covering. We have the Freedom Forum that is extremely active internationally and becoming even more so. Eleven libraries abroad now established, uh, computer equipped, suburb databases for all journalists from Hong Kong to Eastern Europe to uh, get information. I mean, if, if journalism is factual information, you can get it from the computers and the Freedom Forum. 
You have many other fellowship programs. I mentioned the Knight Fellowship, sending uh, journalists overseas and sabbaticals to teach journalists in Africa and elsewhere, sort of a press corps, peace corps, been active for several years. And uh, others that I, I don't have the time to name, but even the U.S. government has been doing up to this year an enormous amount, really. Uh, the International Media Fund in Eastern Europe, they um, trying to jumpstart the press in some former communist countries, even bought a printing press for new newspapers in Albania, helped TV broadcasting, but the government is getting out of that short-term program. Government's getting out a lot of programs. The problems, fragile economy, of course, in Africa, Eastern Europe, Ukraine. Uh, these journalists, these newspapers, broadcasters, have been dependent on government funding, of course, as they try to make their own way. They've got to get their own s sources of money. Uh, Latvia is strapped for resources. Can't even get paper and ink, really. Very difficult. Uh, they need training for journalists. Uh, paper shortages are a problem elsewhere in the world. And uh, generally, the funding. Now, foundations, international foundations, have been a valuable source of resources, certainly in Eastern Europe. But my colleague Ed Fui, former broadcaster who is interested in uh, developing uh, media abroad, tells me that the, one of these organizations, the Transatlantic Dialogue on Broadcasting, run by a colleague of his from the BBC, could get no funding this year from the European Union for its activities. You know, and its main mission is to help build an independent uh, news departments and state run or independent new televisions in Eastern Europe. Couldn't get any funding from the European Union. And he is concerned that um, maybe foundations are losing interest, which is a pity. <clears throat> and the point being, of course, that foundations should know, as we know, that how can you build a democracy anywhere if you do not have free press institutions? Now, I'm more familiar with CNN uh, operations, and particularly the CNN World Report, uh, which we, where we run unedited video packages put together from television organizations around the world. They just send them to us, and we put them on the air, no uh, money exchange. Now, I must admit that when World Report, which was most innovative, first went on the air in 1987, there was a high cringe factor. If you were watching it, the video was pretty bad, the audio was even worse, and the content of those packages, thank goodness we didn't have uh, many viewers in those days, heavy on features and a lot of rubbishy stuff. But let me give credit, if any needs to be given, any more to Ted Turner's vision. I have been informed I'm entitled to one commercial during this speech, so I'll, I'll do it for Ted. Ted's vision, his foresight, because not only did CNN use the TV products from around the world, we invited the broadcasters initially to annual conferences in Atlanta, launched an international professional uh, program that is six weeks in duration, we help new broadcasters develop writing, editing skills, managing pra management practices, buying advertising, salesmanship. We provide the whole ton of broadcasting staff is at their, at, their, at their disposal. We've helped just recently personnel from five new TV stations that have just opened in Russia and new broadcasters in the Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Estonia, Belgrade, where the famous Studio B uh, operates the voice of the opposition in Serbia. And today there is no cringe factor when you watch the World Report. The quality is often up to CNN news standards, in fact. We air it every day, nearly six hours of original broadcasting every week, and that comes from 150 broadcasters from 115 countries around the world. And our membership is cr increasing at the rate of 20% annually. So. You can see the, the, the input that we are getting from countries around the world. And in exchange, they are getting from us expertise and advice and, 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 and other support in their own operations. Of course, the other factor that ensures CNN's acceptance around the world was our coverage from both sides of the Gulf War. And we've come to see that that gave an international credibility to the American news media that it never before had existed. 
we, not just in CNN, but the American media, became more trusted. So now you can have Nightline showing in Europe and Asia. Now Katie Couric on the Today Show is, is visible. The concerns in Europe and elsewhere that uh, American had imperialistic journalism are less evident now. And part of it was the Gulf War coverage that CNN takes pride in, in having done, but also other American media, all the other American media did a fine job in covering that Gulf War. So we run these uh, broadcasters through our training programs. They come to visit and interesting what they ask us, these broadcasters and radio people. How much government control is there at CNN, they want to know. Do we kill stories the government disapproves of? Are we beholden more than we admit to promoting government policies? And uh, they want to know basic things like what international, what, you know, what geopolitical factors make an international news story? That sort of stumped me, you know. Why is Rwanda important finally? Well, it was after a while, or why is Bosnia less important? But that sort of discussion they have. What domestic news of their own is of interest to the outside world? <coughs> Many of these broadcasters and news people tell us, frankly, they can't be objective back home, particularly Africa and the Middle East. If they were, it would be their hides, but we find that many of these people are dissident intellectuals. They take pride in being fair and accurate, and they're brave, and some have made it to the CPJ's casualty lists. Of course, as some of the broadcasters take a few shortcuts. Uh, a gentleman from a news station in U Uganda told us a couple of weeks ago of a foolproof way he had of getting advertising. He said he would simply do stories on the companies that purchased his, uh, his ads. We told him that was not quite the way to create a, a free press. In personnel from Channel A in Slovenia, it's a new private broadcasting outlet, impressed uh, World Report executives with their daring style and they had a funky use of graphics. And they build themselves as the underdogs in the business in Slovenia. But we find that they're gaining fast on the opposition. And the way they do that, that each evening, Channel A's news reports are being sandwiched between three pornographic movies. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> of course, our enthusiastic colleagues abroad uh, often collide with retrogressive politicians with their own cultures. The developing media, of course, wants changes to be made in the scene. But as we have seen, as their influence increases in their home regions, as their demands grow for more freedoms, so does direct action against them intrude upon their hopes. Murder, imprisonment have become the bloody birth pangs of a freer world. And more and more you hear about press laws, demands for media responsibility in, in these countries. What are these but, but code phrases for controls of the media? So what can we do to further the cause of the adolescent media in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, aid the growth of the independent press in Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere? First of all, we can do more and we must do more. I've held the fine efforts already being made by our own professional organizations and media, media companies. Direct action through the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Overseas Press Club and the Freedom Forum and other concerned media groups can have immediate results. When the CPJ was advised last year of the arrest of a reporter and editor-in-chief of a leading newspaper in the Albanian capital, uh, arrested for reporting the, quote, state secret, unquote, that the government would take guns away from off-duty army officers, a protest was quickly faxed from the CPJ to the government. The trials went ahead anyway, and there were convictions, but a second detailed protest worked just one day after it was publicized internationally. And the news people were released, and there was a bonus, a marked decline in the legal harassment of Albania's increasingly independent news media. The Freedom Forum facilities in Hong Kong recently became a forum for a protest against the Indonesian government's closure of three Jakarta newspapers the forum flew the three editors of the Indonesian papers to Hong Kong for a widely attended press conference to publicize the assault on media freedom. We can appeal to our government to place 
media issues on the political gen agenda when dealing with repressive companies, as did happen in Tajikistan. The CPJ's own Bill Orm in a personal visit to that Central, Central Asian country last year highlighted the bloody struggle of journalists. Twenty-five reporters and editors had been killed in Tajikistan in the previous 30 months. Now press agenda, uh, press freedom is on the agenda when our government meets with theirs. And let's remind our diplomats that worthy countries such as Poland have been promising for years to allow an independent TV media. Last year the government passed legislation that was supposed to finally permit independent broadcasting, but they still haven't issued any licenses. And Romania and other countries that are um, proving most unwilling to give up control of broadcasting. So they should be nudged towards that fact. But let's face it, press freedom is not a high priority for any government, sometimes even our own, I feel. So in the final analysis, we can do more of what we do best ourselves, publicize abuses of our media colleagues. For example, for our international correspondents, allow them to report on the reporters just as they do on developing political systems and free markets. Uh, we sometimes detect, I sometimes detect, a reluctance to defend our own press interests abroad. That it's easier to speak out on behalf sometimes of imprisoned doctors or political students than journalists. But press freedom should be a routine item on our checklist when we visit these countries. I don't believe it's special pleading to highlight the struggles of the emerging media abroad. We know from our own history that a free press is an integral part of a free society, societies that we as a people and human beings applaud. We are rightly spotlighting the travails of the media in our coverage of Russia, where the press story is major news. But are we giving attention to the rest of the developing world? Vietnam, for example, where many of us are heading in the next few weeks to cover the 20th anniversary of the war's end. Does the Vietnamese government give as much attention to press freedom as it does to American investment in that country? Let's hope we read about it and see it on our TV programming. Publicity, publicity, information, that's what we are all about. It's our most powerful weapon. Let's use it more to help our embattled colleagues. Just one example, the Argentine government recently drafted legislation that promised draconian libel laws uh, directed at the media, sort of high fine, low proof laws. The New York Times editorially criticized the upcoming legislation and it's been dropped, apparently for good. Publicity, publicity. You have to know what's going on, of course, in the world to be involved and let me recommend the best journalist tip sheet in the business it's the International Free Exchange Network, known by the acronym IFEX. It's created by the Com Canadian Committee to Protect Journalists, headquartered in Toronto. And IFEX keeps you daily up to date on the state of the media internationally with names and addresses, victims and violators. It's a scorecard on the state of freedom in the world today. Every news organization, every reporter should be hooked into the IFEX system after all, facts are our business, the truth is our business. Moving into the existing technology is a necessity, and all of the forum, Freedom Forum's publications, for example, are now on the internet, as are many others. So that's something about the struggle to establish an American-style media in the world's emerging democracies, and some of the reasons why I feel we should do more to assist our embattled colleagues, and it's certainly worth thinking about on this Freedom of Information Day. Thank you. Uh, now we'll have questions, and uh, uh, they're uh, for a variety of, uh, <laughs> a number of our speakers. First for you, Mr. Arnett. Can you give us an update on Iraq? Should the embar embargo on the sale of Iraqi oil be eased? Certainly the Iraqis believe the sanctions should be uh, lifted. I was there last October, and they... CNN, along with many other journalists, were invited, and uh, they did make the eloquent argument that the population was suffering grievously, were being harmed by the continued uh, implementation of the sanctions. While we were there, the 
Russian Foreign Minister arrived to support Iraq's claim, and it's clearly clear since then that France and other countries are getting behind the Iraqi plea that uh, the sanctions be lifted. The U.S. government's course, of, of course, has prevailed in its view that it is too early, that uh, more pressure should be put on Saddam Hussein. We read, and, and only by this pressure will he totally, will he, will, 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 will he totally uh, implement the U.N. requirements for the sanctions to be lifted, or the other side of the coin being that he'll be overthrown. And I keep reading these days about attempted coup d'etats, possible coup d'etats against him. So if you're sympathetic to the Iraqis, clearly the sanctions should be lifted. If you're sympathetic to the U.S. government point of view, they shouldn't be. Thank you. You spoke about the World Report, and yet uh, a, a question in notes that CNN has uh, bumped it in favor of uh, extensive coverage of the O.J. Simpson trial. When can we expect World Report to be back on schedule? CNN's bumping virtually everything in favor of the O.J. Simpson trial simply because there seems to be an insatiable public demand for information about that trial. Not only the detailed minute-by-minute -minute court coverage of what's going on, but discussion about it, endless discussion. People phone us, they fax us, they send letters saying, keep it all coming. So, you know, as I used to say about the Vietnam War, one day it'll be over. And I think that one day the O.J. Simpson trial will be over. I would like to point out that CNN has another channel called CNN International, seen by those who travel beyond the United States and by cre increasing numbers of Americans at home, which does not cover the OJ trial, uh, you know, gavel to gavel, argument to argument, but does have World Report and much other foreign news on it. And uh, why we hope by midsummer that CNN domestically will be back to its old schedule. Thank you. For Dr. Asakop, is freedom of the press in Yemen on the rise or decline since the end of the war? Thank you. Since the war, uh, the scope of freedom of the press in Yemen has diminished dramatically, of course. Uh, I would like to think, and this may be wishful thinking, that this is a temporary phase. Uh, but the facts are that the scope of freedom of the press in Yemen has fallen dramatically. Thank you. I think this is for you, Peter. I'm not sure, but uh, several years ago, the United Nations was pushing a new information order to emphasize good news in the third world and to change the flow of news from the developed to developing countries. What happened to that movement? Are you familiar with that? Or yeah. Dr. All I right. Can address. Yeah. <clears throat> I can address that. It was a UNESCO attempt to create a new information order in the late 60s and the 70s. It was vehemently opposed by the US mainstream media, and it died a natural death, as did at the time, really, American participation in UNESCO, which I believe is still it's still, we're still not back in UNESCO. But the, I hear recurring attempts to, to sort of reestablish some kind of uh, ideal that more positive reporting, you know, come out of the developing world, that it would be in the best interests of uh, nations to get a positive viewpoint placed on them. I think if you talk to any reporters in the new media in these emerging countries, they want to get out there and do exactly what we're doing in the United States, tell the truth. You know, with the, their equivalent of glasnost and perestroika, get information out there, shake up the government, shake up the authorities and the institutions, and let's get moving towards real democracy. Thank you. Questioner asks, what problems are created when the U.S. press does a better job than the local press in a country in covering that country's problems. For example, in Mexico, the U.S., or so the
questioner says, does a better job than Mexican journalists in covering assassinations, corruption, and the influence of drug money on politics in Mexico. What problems does that create for American journalists? I don't think that's always true. I think the Mexi there are superb Mexican journalists, superb Mexican newspapers, and, uh, and I, would, I, w I would question whether our reporting is, is superior, and even if it is, the Mexican people don't really get access to it. Uh, CNN is seen there, and other, other American news media, I guess, crosses the border. But um, I don't really think it, it, it is a fact of what we do and what they do. What I found personally, however, being with CNN in a place like Haiti, is that where the ruling establishment watches CNN on a 24-hour basis, then anything I did on the air was immediately noticed, and it was only within a, within a few days after I arrived that people would pass by and throw things at me while I was going live from downtown, or threaten me for the coverage that they were seeing back at their uh, own uh, homes. And so I think is, uh, is the U.S. media starts being projected back into these communities, we'll maybe having continuing problems, such as in Somalia. Really, though, wherever U.S. media go and there's any kind of environment where there's a developing local media, they will come to us for advice. We will turn to them for assistance. And so if we are superior in our performance, hopefully we can lift up the local broadcasters and reporters along with us and really improve their product. Uh, recently, a popular Russian television broadcaster was murdered for speaking out against organized crime. Apart from marshalling public sympathy <coughs> after the killing of a reporter, what can we in America do to prevent crimes from being committed against journalists? Well, I guess that's why we're all here today. We had the panels this morning to discuss it. The press club gives awards to brave journalists, uh, domestically and internationally, who, who, who tell the truth. I would, I would think Russia is a good example of where we are interested in the fate of the media. We do see the media as being essential to the development of a democracy over there. And, and I must say that our attention to that issue has forced the Yeltsin government to come to terms with it. And the fact that the government reacted so directly to the death of that broadcaster, you know, it, it, it indicates that they're, they're concerned about it. The Russian people were concerned about it. That was the most wonderful demonstration of faith in free speech when the whole Russian people mourned the death of this, of, of this man. This basically a talk show host. But they figured that what he was saying was important to their lives. So, if you wanted an example that democracy was catching on in Russia, that was the example. Finally, ultimately, it's up to the Russians themselves to, to prevent abuses against their own people. I know many Russian journalists, they're very capable, and they're militant, and the Russian media continues to thrive despite attempts to attack uh, those within the media. You mentioned uh, technology especially Freedom Forum databases. What role have faxes, computers, email, and internet played in freeing the press and the peoples of the world from repression of information? We don't know yet what's the impact of all this information superhighway. Now look at the internet, talking to one of um, my colleagues yesterday, and she was saying, you know, the internet, be careful of the internet. There are no journalistic gatekeepers on the internet. You have lots of information flowing. Where does it come from? Who's putting it on there? Is it real? <clears throat> but it's there, we know it's there. And uh, so we've got to, I think we have to be very cautious about what we see on computers, but the truth is they are there. We've seen it with the, with the phenomenon of the faxes in the Soviet Union during the 80s when academic institutions were faxing information to each other and government the authorities had difficulty intercepting it. The Tiananmen Square disaster where Chinese students in the United States were faxing back to their alma mater's information that they were picking up the, the U.S. media and what was going on to inform the 
the Chinese public about what was going on, the, the existence of uh, satellite dishes all over the world now where people can get more information. My basic feeling about it all is that more information is better than less information, and the more we know about the world, the more that is available, the better, and I detailed earlier ways that we can get access to information, and, and in other areas of life, institutions, because they have access too to similar uh, information. But the more information, the better, and certainly there is more information. After the Persian Gulf War, U.S. reporters complained of censorship and delays by the U.S. military that hampered news gathering. What lessons did we learn from that experience? <clears throat> Unfortunately, after four years, I'd say that the lesson the media learned is that never trust the Pentagon. And the lesson the Pentagon learned was never trust the media. Just yesterday at noon, I was at Fort McNair at an officer's training course, the end of a 10-month program, and you know, lieutenant colonels were there, none of whom had served in Vietnam. And they basically were quite hostile to me. They said, why should we trust you or the press? I mean, we saw what Connie Chung did, and you're all like that. You know? And I thought what Connie Chung did was innocent enough. OK, she got Newt's mother to tell the truth. You know, and it, it, it dismays me that after all these years that I've been in the news business, that there is a, still a continuing hostility between the Pentagon and the media. I, it's, I've heard of numerous conversations we have with information officers about you know, doing it better the next time. Leading up to the Gulf War, our uh, Washington bureau chief, Bill Headline, and bureau chiefs from all the mainstream media spent endless hours in the Pentagon. They figured out a pool system of reporting. We spent millions going to the Gulf, going out with units, getting equipment. You know, the journalists even had to get into physical shape, had to run a mile or something. You know, it was very difficult, most of these guys and gals. When the war started, of course, we, the pools didn't go anywhere, really. And when they did see anything, they weren't allowed to report it, because General Schwarzkopf, my old buddy Stormer Norman, says, hey, you know, we don't want the American public to learn that some of our soldiers, you know, feel that George Bush is goofing off on his cigarette boat and not being interested in what we're doing. So I think there's still a long way to go to, and what, what I say to military people that I meet is that, you know, we are here. Next time you go abroad, when you went to Haiti recently, when the, when the military arrived in Haiti, there were, you know, six or seven hundred media there. CNN had microwave dishes all over Port-au-Prince. So uh, we were there. Others were there. So we exist. We are part of the, we are an institution of the United States. We get, we've got to get along together uh, with the Pentagon. And I hope we can somehow bridge our differences in the event that the U.S. is involved in yet uh, another international altercation. But the U.S. will be involved. I hear that American forces, some numbers will be going to Bosnia in the near future. So we have to be able to better work with our own Pentagon as we need to with other military uh, forces around the world. Well, before we get to our last question, uh, I have a presentation to make, a certificate of appreciation, Peter, Thank for you. Thank you. joining us today, <coughs> coffee mug on Thank your you. late good. vigils. <laughs> okay. I uh, also have a, a little confession to make. We went to uh, elaborate uh, preparations for... Uh, today's luncheons. We had committees and subcommittees screening all the applications, and we had many of them for the awards we made today. We went through uh, very secret negotiations to inform the winners of the uh, awards uh, before it was made public. We went to, uh, through elaborate uh, uh, arrangements to bring Dr. al Sakaf here from Yemen took three days. Everything went very well, except for one thing. I forgot to bring the awards, so. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know, however, that they will be presented. <coughs> uh, final question, Peter. One that we're all waiting for you to answer. Have you and Senator Simpson made up? <laughs> 
<clears throat> Senator Simpson, that is a name from the past. Soon after the Gulf War, Senator Simpson offered an apology for what he said were some extreme remarks he'd made about my conduct. I accepted it, and we've moved on to other wars and other crises since. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us today, and remember our lineup of coming speakers in the next week or two. Good afternoon. Oh, my. All right.